Can't take the stress? Can't take the pressure? Well, sometimes rocks can't either. Between all the isostatic adjustments and the tectonic plate motion that's actually taking place, rocks will fold, bend, and finally crack under pressure. And so we're going to learn about how this actually happens. And to understand this concept, first we have to review the idea of force and pressure. Now force, of course, is the energy that's applied to an object in order to make it into translate into motion. But sometimes the object cannot move and that causes the object to go undergo stress. And that's what we have to talk about. But before we can understand stress, the idea of pressure. Pressure is how much force is applied to a certain area. So for example, I don't have the power to completely knock down a wall. No matter how much force I put in that wall, I cannot do it. I don't want to be strong enough for that. But if I focus my force in one spot, I can punch through the wall. Most people could. And that's because I can put more pressure by focusing all that force in a small area. Now imagine if this weight here was distributed over a large area, there's going to be less pressure. And if the material is not allowed to move, is going to be under less stress than it would if there was more. So for example here, when you have a foot and you step on three nails, all your weight goes in those nails, you're going to have more pressure and you're going to have greater amount of stress when the, they can't move and so that's going to hurt you. But if you sit on a nail bed that has thousands of nails and you spread your weight across thousands of nails, that pressure is going to be very low and that's going to be put you on the last stress and so now that you understand the idea of stress or pressure which is how much force per unit area the object is under and then if your object cannot move it's going to undergo stress and rocks experience the same because of those isostatic adjustments and plate tectonics and so stress will be greater if the object is not allowed to move or if it's under constant constant pressure all right now there's th two kinds of stress okay there's hydrostatic stress and there's direct stress. The hydrostatic stress is what you see on the left side of the cube here, where the same amount of pressure is experienced from all sides. That means the object will probably maybe uh, implode, or if the stress was in the opposite direction, it will explode, but it would not necessarily uh, deform uh, in the sense of a, the sh overall shape would not change. You know, it would be compressed the same way everywhere or stretch the same way everywhere because the force or the pressure applied to the object is the same everywhere. That's basically what we experienced here by being under the atmosphere. We learn, when we learn about air pressure, the same pressure from all sides, which is why an aneroid barometer works. It's constantly pressured on all sides the same, but when you take it to an area with lower air pressure, it's going to be allowed to expand, and when it's going to higher, higher pressure, it's going to be compressed the same on all sides. It's also this kind of pressure which makes us unable to dive too deep or even submarines have limitations of how deep they can go because of the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure of water compressing the object from all sides. And it's what causes the formation of nodules at the bottom of the ocean floor because those sediments are being pressed from all sides. So that's hydrostatic pressure. We're going to be focusing mostly on directed pressure or differential stress, which happens when one side receives more stress than another, causing the object to actually change its overall shape. All right? And so that's what we'll be focusing on in this chapter. Now, rocks undergo a lot of differential stretcher, pressure. One type of stress that rocks undergo is called compressive stress. And that's if, for example, on top here, you see the normal object under no stress. Now, if I start compressing this object, that means I'm going to be squeezing it. What's going to happen? Parallel to the line of where I squeezed it, you know, in a parallel direction, I'm going to be shortening the object. But on the perpendicular direction, I'm actually going to be stretching the object. And that's characteristic of any time I'm going to be doing compressive stress, which is very common, by the way, on convergent boundaries. Remember that? When the plates are moving against each other, which is what causes mountains and things, valleys and things like that. Then you also have tensional stress. And tensional stress or tension happens when you stretch the object. And in that case, Parallel to the line of the stress, you're going to have stretching taking place, but perpendicular to the stress, it's actually going to shorten the object. And that's what's actually going to happen in the case of divergent boundaries, for example, when the um, plates are moving up away from each other. Now, this is basically going to separate the pieces of rock and it's going to be stretching the rock while the other one is going to be bringing the pieces of rock closer together. 
Now, in shear stress, the actual distance between the pieces of rock will not actually change, but it will actually deform the rock because what happens with shear stress is when one side is applied in one direction while the other side is applied in the other direction, and so the pressure is applied in different directions at different sides of the rock, causing the block to neither shorten or elongate parallel or or perpendicular to the stress, but what will actually happen is it will actually cause the, the thing to, to change its overall shape as well. So compressive stress will be something like squeezing a piece of paper. Tensional stress will be something like stretching a piece of paper. And shear stress will be like bending this piece of paper in different directions. And that's what will happen to rock. Of course, the last one here will be very common among uh, boundaries which are where the rock is sliding past each other and so you should know that as transform boundaries. So you see that these kinds of stress will be more common in different kinds of boundaries and you keep that in your mind because you're going to need that later as well. Now because of such stress the rocks will actually change. Now remember do not get them, these two things confused. Stress is the force that's applied in a certain area or the pressure that the rock is put under. Strain is what happens to the rock because of that pressure or stress. In other words Stress is the action, strain is the reaction. Strain is how the rock actually changes in response to the stress. So for example, because of compression stress, the rock will fold and form these kinds of structures here, synclines and anticlines, and because it will also crack under a lot of stress and form things called reverse faults or trust faults. And then you also have under tensional stress, the rock will stretch or thin out. And when it faults, it falls with what we call a normal fault. Under shear stress, the rocks will bend in, in, in these kinds of S-like conformations. And when they fault, we call them transform faults. All right. And so you see that the kinds of strain that will happen will depend on the kinds of stress that's actually applied. Now, these things here we call folds, and these things here we call faults, which means the rocks can either bend or change shape, or they can actually break. But you see, how they break and how they actually bend depends on the kinds of stress that's applied. And we're going to review this in the end as we finish talking about stress and strain. Okay? So here's a review of what we just talked about. If I get a crank and a bunch of rock, and we can try to do this in class if, uh, if I find a device to do so. But basically, if you actually get a crank and you squeeze a bunch of sand, what you're going to end up happening is this. On the side that's actually being stretched, you're going to have tension taking place. On the side that's actually being compressed, you're going to have shortening taking place, right? And so you're going to have those structures that we just saw happening. You're going to have normal faulting happen here, right, where the thing is going to fall lower, and you're going to have reverse faulting happen here when the pieces are going to go higher instead of lower. And you're going to have shear stress in both cases because the pieces will move slide past each other. So... And there will also be bending. You see how the bending took place here by the end? You see the rock is actually bending in this case. And so you see that the kinds of bends that happen, though, will be different in times of place. One will stretch and call it to thin out. The other will actually bend and cause synclines and anticlines. And so we're going to review this as we move along and talks about stress and strain at the end. But the, the critical point is that different kinds of stress will create different kinds of strain different kinds of faults, different kinds of folds, okay? Now, before we talk about that, we have to talk about the different kinds of materials which will experience these things. Now, brittle materials are materials which will tend to crack under pressure or under stress, like this rock on top left did. It cracked under the pressure of the, of the initially formed faults. That's the kind of strain that actually happened. Now, rocks which are a little more plastic-like or a little more ductile, they have a higher plasticity, will actually fold instead of cracking. And you see how this rock here uh, actually folded because of the stress and displayed that kind of strain instead of that kind of strain. So ductile strain is called folding. Brittle strain is called faulting. All right? And different materials are going to be more likely to either break or fold depending on certain situations, all right? So another thing that can actually happen is, is elasticity. Some rocks will bend at first, but after the tension is gone or the, or the compression is gone or the shear stress is gone, after the pressure is no longer there, the rock returns to its normal shape. And you actually see that happening here. That's, kind of, that's actually kind of like the things that actually cause earthquakes. When a rock that's bent suddenly returns to its actual shape after slipping, you cause that elastic rebound. So the rocks have a certain degree of elasticity to them as well. Almost like you know, a rubber band that's being stretched. 
and it's bending all right it's plastic like so just like you see the bottom here but if you let it go it will turn to the normal and that's what elasticity is all about all right rocks also have a certain degree of viscosity which is how flowy this this rock actually is think about lava for example what you're actually seeing is flowing rock and so rocks can have certain different degrees of viscosity of how flowy they can possibly be and you also have a, something called viscoelasticity which is the idea of the, the rocks are both flowing and bending at the same time and can return to the original shapes if allowed to do so All right so a quick review ductile strain is a call it we call folds brittle strain we call faults, all right? And rocks are going to be more or less likely to do that depending on how plastic-like they are. Rocks can also be elastic and viscous depending on the type of rock that you're talking about, all right? And depending on this, you're going to have different kinds of strain. Now, there are strain can also be applied in different ways, okay? You have longitudinal strain, which is strain that, or linear strain, which is a strain that's applied parallel to the object for example compression or tension and then you have shear strain which actually happens when when the when the object is under shear stress right because think about it it's different when you look at something like these two you see that the the uh, the, the pressure is being applied in one direction whether compressing or stretching it but this actually is applied in two different directions so these are what we call linear or longitudinal st strains and these are the non-linear or non-longitudinal uh, strains okay so you also have the idea of infinitesimal or, fi or versus finite strain when you actually study rocks the, this strain is typically applied to the rock on a very very slowly and so you have the idea that there's very very small deformations or very small cracks over long periods of time that's actually happening and that's how we actually study geology in terms of very fractional minuscule amounts of strain and that's what we call infinitesimal while finite strain is actually measurable and visible, large amounts of strain that happen at the same, that's all at the same time. And typically in geology, we're talking about infinitesimal strain because it takes a long, long time for rocks to actually bend or crack. All right? And then you also have the idea of homogeneous versus inhomogeneous strain. Um, homogeneous strain will happen if a rock, the entire rock, were under the same, actual same stress. But that's not usually what happens in geology. You see that here in this rock. The whole rock didn't crack. It was only this part of the rock that cracked. And these folds that happened in this mountain were not exactly the same throughout the entire mountain. So you see that the, the strain it was actually different in different parts of rock because different parts were under different amounts of stress. And so that's inhomogeneous strain or strain that's different depending on different parts of the rock because typically in geology, you don't have... Uh, stress applied to the rock exactly the same way everywhere in the rock all right now on how much the rock changes will also de depend on a variety of factors and we'll continue on that on our next video